Greetings, Wilkinson here. I'm back. Been away for a while. Between uh, the theater stuff I've been involved in, surgery, and the vacations, as you know, I took a break. But now I'm back, and I'm going to hopefully get back on schedule. My guest today is Steve Milliken. He's from Santa Monica. We met on Facebook, I don't know, late last year sometime, I think. So first of all, Steve, say hi to my people. Hello. Glad to be here. Okay. So we, you know, I always have these chats like 15 minutes before we do the podcast with well, whomever my guest is, but we had a 15 minute chat that went three hours. So <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think that broke a record for the last two years on, on doing that. But anyway, here we are. So let's see where we want to start. So you've been a number of things in different careers. You've been a hairstylist. That was after I scheduled my first midlife crisis. After college, I decided I didn't want to grow up, and so I started pursuing acting and comedy, and I did stand-up comedy and improv uh -huh. comedy, and I was always a waiter part-time. Right. So I did that for like about 20, 25 years, and then I was kind of like, you know, I can't be a waiter anymore. I can't do this. So I became a hairstylist, went to beauty school a couple years, and then I got totally bored with that because I realized I was playing with life-size dolls. <laughs> and one of my clients... Were you or your boss, your clients male or female or both? Both. Okay. Yeah. So it wasn't like a men's shop? No, no, no. It was at Carlton. Okay. And where the money was really bad. You made like 20% of your commission what? sales. Yep. It was pretty bad. It was and like how long, maybe... And how long were you there? Well, I went to beauty school for... Two no, years. I mean at, at the place that's ripping you off. How long were you there? Oh, well, I started out like I didn't want to be an assistant, so I worked at this salon and maintained being a waiter, and I really didn't know what I was doing because beauty school doesn't really teach you the practical things that you need to know. So after that year, then my friend said, why don't you be an assistant at Carlton, and they teach you everything. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll do that. So I was an assistant for a year, and then I had my own chair for two years. When you had your own chair, they don't take 20%. Before. No, they do. That's I mean, how Carlton I mean, they, they give you 20% when you have your own chair? If or they you take do $1,000 in sales and procedures and all right. that, you make $200. And how long did you do that? I did that for two years, and then I was making next to nothing. And then one of my clients said, you know, Nowadays, to become a teacher, you just have to have your bachelor's and you can be a district intern while you're teaching full time. And I thought, wow. So that's what I did. So you became a teacher. I became a high school English teacher. In the good part of town. Not so much. <laughs> I was, uh, I liked, I didn't, I didn't know what I was getting into. And I worked at the first uh, school that I interviewed at, I got hired on the spot. So I worked at Huntington Park High School, which is in Southeast LA. So I was like 99% Latino. So I was there for nine and a half years. And then the district stepped in and uh, took over the school. And I did get hired back. They hired back 20% of the original staff because they wanted to blame it on the teachers. So 80% were let go. And then that year was absolute insanity because the the administration just was terrible. They didn't know what they were doing. And so then I finally did get displaced. And then I was in um, South Central for two years. And that was really crazy. And then I got to go back to Southeast LA and I finished up for five years at Bell High School. So my high school English teacher career was 16 years. And you talk a lot about that in your new book. Right. Which is called what? Late Bloomer, Baby Boomer a collection of humorous essays about being gay back in the day and finally finding my way. Wait, you're gay? Sometimes. <laughs> Your total head-to-toe pink outfit, it doesn't really... Was that, I that thought up. it might be the stilettos that <laughs> gave it away. I'm kidding. He's trusting. Me. Yeah, my hook for the book is what happens when the class clown becomes the teacher. And that's the way I taught. I incorporated humor into the class. I taught what I needed. I was a good teacher. I taught what I needed to teach. But I found the humor in everything, so I was always interjecting humor, and the students really liked it, and it grabbed their attention. I mean, I still had a lot of problematic students, but that I was very unique in teaching because I would befriend the class clown because they were usually could be like the most problematic students. So right. I would say, you know, I can tell you're funny, and would you like to be funnier? 
I'm like, oh, I don't know, mister. Well, I guess. I go, well, here's what you got to do. You got to start doing your homework. You got to start doing your reading. You got to start paying attention. You can still be funny and I'll help you out with that. And this is only something that only someone who's truly funny can share this information because with humor, you, you're either funny or you're not. You cannot learn how to be funny. But if you are funny, you can develop it like going to the gym and, right. and get funnier. So, and you have to be smart to be funny. So I would tell the student, I go, you're smart. Obviously your grades aren't showing it, <laughs> but I encourage you to be funny. I, like my own, you know, it made my job harder, but I encouraged the class clown because that, you know, it's fun. I love, you know, I used to do stand up comedy. I used to do improv comedy. I was always, I thought one of my problems with acting was that I was a comic character actor trapped in a leading man's body. And so they could never really see what to do with me. Plus a huge problem back in the late seventies and the eighties, mid nineties, when I was pursuing it, most of the casting directors were gay men. So they went out of their way not to cast an actor that they even perceived to be gay because they thought, oh, he's hiring the gay actor. So that made it even more difficult. Plus there were no openly gay actors back then it was so taboo so everybody was in the closet except maybe a handful so that was the main reason why i think i didn't make it when i wanted to because it was just so taboo to be gay hmm. there's also and this is really weird but um everyone accepts a straight actor playing a gay role like give him an academy award you know tom hanks in philadelphia right. william hurt spider-man Everyone accepts that. I accept that. But a large percentage of people, like, they do not accept a gay actor playing a straight role. Like, even I don't accept that. I look at that and go, hmm, man, nah, not so much. He's gay. We so there's this girl. internalized yeah. homophobia. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, and we're guilty of it just as much as everybody else. But people s still to this day, except maybe the younger generation, they don't accept openly gay men playing straight roles. They accept straight ro straight guys playing gay, but the opposite isn't true. It's just, you know, our upbringing in a homophobic society, you know, it's ingrained in us. Go so, back to school. So you, so did your students call you Mr.? Is that what they called Yes, that's why. Uh, it's custom, it's tradition. It's They call uh, female teachers Miss, and they call male teachers Mr. They never call it, when I was new, I was saying, it's Mr. Milliken. Okay, mister. It's just tradition. It's That's the way it is. Is that in that? Everywhere. In those, all of the schools, even the higher end? I think so. I never taught in like um, white communities like West LA or Beverly Hills. or. I've never heard of that before. Oh, yeah. Everyone, you're mister or miss. Oh. Huh. Yeah, it's just so standard. It's like they never, once in a while, they'll say Mr. Milliken, like maybe 1% of the time. So it's just, it's cultural. It's just the, the way the schools are. Mm. You never, it's always like Mr. or Miss. So the cat's out of the bag. You said you're gay. Yeah. Now tell what me, was, me I wasn't your... openly gay per se, but I was not in the closet. Okay, so okay, when stop, it's. Stop, stop. I'm asking the question. Let me okay. ask it. <laughs> okay. So let's go back to your, uh, so tell me a little of your coming out story. What, what's your history? Okay. Well, I didn't start going to gay bars until I was in my early 20s. And what happened to me was that I started to have thoughts about other boys from gym class. And so I knew that within the Catholic Church that that was a sin. So I went to confession and I confessed that I was having impure thoughts. And so the priest said, well, how old are you? And I said, 13. He goes, okay, we'll just never do it again. There'll be 25 Our Fathers and 30 Hail Marys. And stupid me, I wouldn't allow myself to think of other boys. So I never learned how to masturbate until early 20s. Yeah, I just thought, I, I, I hate, I was such a good Catholic boy and I hated going to confession. So I thought if I don't allow myself to think of it, I could think about girls, but it didn't turn me on. So I never really learned. That and there, was, back that was, then, yeah. there was no one to talk about. There, there was no internet. There were no gay role models. There was no, and the, it was so shunned. You know, back in the late 60s, society as a whole, they thought homosexuality, 
rape, incest, they're all pretty equal. They're all crimes. And, and murder, rather and murder, don't forget murder. That's in there too. <laughs> yeah. So it was a crime. So it was just verboten to talk about it. To it was so horrible to be gay that, and then I just I would have. This is this is the extent of my, uh, like how much I didn't want to be gay. I'm one of the last ages that would have been drafted for the Vietnam War. I would have gone to Vietnam before admitting that I was gay. That's how much I didn't want to be gay. Are you over that? Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't go to many wars, so yeah. Oh, but are you over the shame of that? Um, yeah. I think that the coming out process never ends, and so it's a lifelong process. We keep chipping away. We keep increasing our acceptance about who we are, but there's still always a little bit of shame, at least like. For me, but I think for everyone, I think it's a standard that the coming out process never ends. We're always chipping away. We're always increasing our self-acceptance. So talk about your family. Are you an only child? No, I have one older brother. He was two years older, and he would, like, call me sissy, like, a lot. I, I sort of was like, there was, like, my home life where my brother and I didn't get along, and then there was at school where... Once in a while, I would get called sissy, but my defense mechanism was to be funny and to make someone laugh so that they wouldn't call me sissy. Just like, you know, the overweight person makes you laugh so that you don't call them fat. So starting like at six, I knew something wasn't quite right because I would look at other boys, but I didn't know what gay was. You don't really understand what sexuality is at that age per se. And my dad accidentally on purpose hit me when I was about six and I was all upset and I ran to my room crying oh daddy doesn't love me daddy that's when he was watching tv right right okay. and so then my mom finally convinced me to come out of my room and my dad didn't apologize he just kept watching tv so I thought that he didn't love me so I have maybe kind of not knowing what gay was but knowing something was off my dad didn't love me, and so I had this overwhelming desire to be popular. I mean, I had to be popular, and I was fairly successful at that. But then what happened to me, my dad was my original role model for humor. I mean, he was funny. And so when I was in the third grade, we moved the last month of third grade. So all of a sudden, you know, I had my friends, I was popular and everything, and then we moved to Pomona, and all of a sudden, in my eight-year-old mind, I'm in this classroom. I don't know anyone. I'm like, oh, my God, I've got to be popular. What am I going to do? So it's not going to be sports. It's not going to be academics. Oh, I'll be funny. So I started doing a character voice, and all the kids were laughing, and I was off to the races. So I, I technically, I decided to be funny when I was eight. And I had those other factors. So, you know, being gay but not knowing what that was thinking my dad didn't love me, and moving the last month of third grade. So those three things, boom, and I was off to the races. I was doing, making the other kids laugh, and I was doing prank phone calls, like at nine and 10 years old. It's all in the book. But, uh, so I was just, you know, just increasing it. So, so were you, were you close to your father? Or no? Uh, we had a, we had a rocky relationship. I mean, in, in retrospect, I realized that he loved me to the extent that he could love. Because he, he was really, able. Yeah. He was very, like most men of that generation, he was very closed off emotionally and he didn't express love. He never, my, he never once said that he loved me. And, but all of his actions where he provided food, shelter, and clothing, which was something he didn't get growing up in the Depression... So, and he was always, we were always going to movies and, um, so, I mean, he did quote, love me, but I didn't see it. So I was always trying to get his love or his approval through other people. I realized, and I didn't realize this until maybe a year or two ago, someone will say like, what are you passionate about? And I was like, oh, I don't know. But what I'm <laughs> passionate about is making people laugh. That's always been my passion. I'm always going for the joke or always going for the humor, fairly successful at it. So yeah. What was the question? We're talking about your dad. Oh yeah. So, so I'm, I'm curious, I'm curious about you coming out. So you okay. said you came out to him, right? 
Well, yeah. At one point, my parents were separated, but they they got sep they got divorced when I was uh, seventeen. And I remember one time driving with my dad, and he goes, "You know, you got to tell me, are you gay or straight? Like, you got to tell me." Oh, he brought that up. He, yeah, he did. And then I said, "I go, well, you know what? I'm going to say I'm bisexual, and so just that's what I'm going to say, and that's what you have to accept." And so, yeah, the coming out process. I think for me, it was almost like it was like. 10 years like the basic coming out process well, what did he say what was it what was his response he was just basically mind? like okay now was he a macho guy yeah i was a policeman he, although he was, he was an shirt. artist and a yeah. writer and oh yeah you know it's funny that this, this happened like 30 years ago and i was at a men's retreat a gay men's retreat and these big buff guys were saying how they used to play with their mom's makeup. And I'm like, oh, my God, I did that, too. It's, it wasn't just me. <laughs> and so they goes, oh, yeah, I did that. So one time when I was like 13 or 14, um, both my parents worked. And I would play with my mom's makeup. And I basically just did the eyes. I was never into like doing like rouge or foundation or anything like this. Right. Just the painting the eyes was what I was really into. So one time I was doing that and my dad came home unexpectedly from work and I was in their uh, bathroom. Uh -oh. and, uh, I'm like, oh my God. And I threw everything back in the makeup kit and put it in the drawer and then ran to my bathroom right when he was coming up the stairs. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God. And so when I went to this men's retreat and I found out that other guys were doing that, I thought, you know what? I'm going to ask my dad and ask him what he would have done if he would have caught me. And my dad said, oh, I probably would have laughed. I was oh. like, what? And But his wife at the time, she said, whether he would have laughed or not is not the point. He accepts you now. He accepts you being gay now. So that's oh. the takeaway from it. But yeah, it wasn't until I was like um, around 40 when I, when I asked him that question. And he, you know, so his response was really great, although I'm not sure he would have responded that way. He was always in denial that I might be gay. They had their concerns and they thought I might be. Yeah, it's like when I, when I had the birds and the bees talk with my dad when I was about 13, and he did like a really terrible job at explaining things like, you know, you're old enough to get a woman pregnant now. I'm like, oh my God, not me, no. And he goes, well, maybe you're not. So he said, here, if you, if you have any questions, just read this book. So he gave me the book, Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Sex, but we're afraid, to, but we're afraid to Ask by Dr. David Rubin. So when he left the room, I immediately turned to the gay part. And the doctor, David Rubin, he said, all gay men just want to have anonymous sex in public bathrooms. Like, that's it. That's in the book. And I thought, oh, 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 that's not me then. I don't think that's what I want. So I'm not gay after all. Oh. So the denial is just like, you know, really heavy. And I also thought that I'd see the boys in PE class and then I'd think about them at night, but I'd not allow myself. But I, I remember I didn't want to kiss them. So I, that meant I wasn't gay. I wanted to give them like a blow job, but because <laughs> I didn't want to kiss them, that means I'm not gay. So I hung, I clung to that. Denial is so strong amongst like gay men. Like we like to start second nature. It's just built into our personality. So when I was married, uh, I mean, for many, many years, it wasn't necessarily the sex. I, I was, I had what the church, rather than all the church that would call same sex attraction, which means they can fix it because you're just attracted. You're not really gay. But for me, it wasn't like his junk that I was, that I would want to see. It was, it was a man's chest that I was attracted to. Oh, it was that's always the chest. Yeah. And, and looking back, I would say it's because what I really wanted was a con was connection at that point. Oh, and I I mean I wouldn't have been able to verbalize it at that point, you know, back then. But looking back at it, that's really what I wanted was I just wanted a connection. You know, I've asked gay men who have been married and have kids, and I've asked them, "How did you function in sex, having sex with a woman?" And 99% of them say, I always imagined that I was having sex with a man. I was always thinking about a man while I was having sex with my wife. That's how they were able to yeah, that, that wasn't That was not true for me. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I got married when I was 22 in college. So, I mean, you're horny. Yeah. What do you know? That, right. So you just, you go on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I remember 
there was another young married couple. I lived in Buffalo, New York. And so the houses were like six feet apart, not even a driveway between them, like a walkway. Mm-hmm. That's how close the houses were. We could like see into each other's apartment. But after, after we got to know each other, so we would have contests to see how many times we could have sex at night with our wives. And I think I got up to eight times once. Wow. <laughs> Wow. But it was so weird. It was, those days were so weird. Yeah. It yeah. Totally, you, totally sounds like you mind. probably would have gotten first place quite often. <laughs> Blue Ribbon. Yeah, there you go. So why'd you write the book? Well, I've been telling funny stories like my entire life. Like it, starting out, it would be I'd tell people about the prank calls that I made. And then there's an essay in the book about my senior year when I was the movie critic for the high school newspaper. I mean, it was, the name of my column was straight from Steve. Little did I know how ironic that would eventually right. become. But um, we would add a vocabulary word when the teacher wasn't looking. She always had like nine vocabulary words, and we would add a tenth word. We would add some Why like, nine? I, I, I don't that. know. It was it like that's so weird. Weird. Yeah. So you would put dirty words up there. We didn't start out with dirty. We 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 started out with like penis, vagina, clitoris, gonorrhea, syphilis, abortion. And she didn't notice that for a while. She did. And sometimes when we wouldn't see, she would have erased it. And finally one day, she was from the South, and she confronted the class, and she said, now, I want y'all to know that I have noticed that someone has been adding a word to my vocabulary list. And when I find out who's been doing it, and then she holds up the pink slips and, and like we're all like trying to hold back our laughter. And so she goes, have I made myself clear? So, But she didn't know which period the person was in or who was it. That was right? another thing. She, she goes, I want y'all, we were fifth period right at right. my lunch. And she goes, now I want y'all to know that I have narrowed it down to fifth or sixth period. Oh, And when I found out who's been doing oh. it. And then we just like doubled our efforts. That's when we got into dirty words because we thought, are we going to give in to her, you know, threats or are we going to double down? So that's what we did. And we did it for about, it was almost the whole semester. And then and nobody snitched on anybody. No. And see, that still holds true. Students, they actually want to learn, although they would probably not be aware of that or not want to admit that. And they will not snitch. And even when I was a teacher, it was next to impossible to get someone to snitch on who was doing something or another. Right. So uh, one day towards the, this guy that was a freshman, we were all seniors, my best friends and I, and he never got his articles published because he would get stuck with like girls archery or, um, you know, girls soccer, something that no one. So he was assigned a topic to write on. Right. He was on the sports page and his articles always got bumped. So he never got published in the newspaper. So he dropped out of the class and was really angry about it. And so one day, and we had run out of words, like we had reverted to dirty words. They're, they're, they're finite. They're not infinite. And then we got to like majorly bad words (laughs) and we literally, we ran out of words. So a couple weeks after the guy dropped out of class, I said to Mrs. Str- and I looked very angelic at the time, and I said to uh, the teacher, I go, by the way, uh, Mrs. Strauss, did you ever notice that there haven't been any new vocabulary words since Mike dropped out of class? And she was like, thank you, Steve. <laughs> so she never found out. In fact, she signed my yearbook. She goes, you added a certain flair to the to the classroom and good luck with your future endeavors. You're, you're a great student. I mean, she never knew. So, but it was really, so Did I Mike ever find out you snitched on him no, when he didn't do it. No. But like that, <laughs> what I was saying was like, I've been telling, I told that story for like 10 years and then it would get, um, what happened in the mid seventies was I moved into the apartment that I still live in now. I've lived in my apartment for 47 years. I tell people I moved in when I was two. So our phone number, this was before answering machines, before call waiting or any or caller ID, we would get the calls for the Department of Motor Vehicles because it was almost the same phone number except two Two numbers transposed. Right. 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 And so my roommates would answer the phone. They'd go, hello. And the person would say, is this the Department of Motor Vehicles? And they go, no, it's not. You got the wrong number. Here's the number. Okay, fine. But if I answered the phone, I'd say hello. 
And they go, is this a Department of Motor Vehicles? And I would say, well, yes, it is. And I want to thank you for calling. What can I do for you? And I would, I would say the most absolutely stupid, ridiculous things to people. And it was just like absolute craziness. And I've always been good at like comedy improv. So I would tell my DMV stories. Like I'd go to a party and I go, oh, I, you know, the DMV story. And, and I would get like this crowd of people around me. And so then there were the DMV stories. And that's one of the essays in my book as well, my prank phone calls. So I've always had stories to tell and, and that just evolved. And, and I forget what the question was again. <laughs> Why'd you write the book? Oh, so the book was when I started teaching, I became a much better writer and I'd always been having this passion for making people laugh. And so after my 30 year high school reunion, I emailed one of this woman that was really funny. I literally had not seen her in 30 years. I wrote her this really funny email and I carbon copied my two friends and then she did the same thing. And so we had these emails going back and forth. They were really funny. And so a friend of mine outside of my high school friend, she said, you should save these emails and turn it into a book because you write just like David Sedaris. And I'm like, who's that? And so then I started reading his books and I was like, oh, I can do this. And then I became a teacher and I'm so crazy busy with teaching. I only wrote like um, one or two essays a year. So I had this collection of essays over a 20 year period. And then once I retired, that now it's time to get it together. And uh, so initially writing the book was all about being funny and expressing my humor and my passion for making people laugh. And then since I published it, I found that there's a gay generation gap and especially uh, like with the Gen Z, the younger millennial gay men against the older gay men's community. And so I, I started putting two and two together and it's like my book is bridging the gay generation gap because when younger gay guys read the, the essays, they're like, I had no idea that was going on. Oh, really? And, that's, and so it's like bridging this historical perspective on being gay. And the gay men that are my age, they're going to naturally find the stories funny because they lived through it at that time. So it's about growing up gay in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and beyond. And it's just, it just turned into a memoir, biography, autobiography, and I just put the essays in chronological order of you know, when they happen. So one of the first essays is called um, Sassy Sissy. And it's about dealing with being, you know, a si being called a sissy every now and then at in, in grade school and my obsession with playing with dolls and not being allowed to and finding the humor and all that and then just getting older. And so a lot of it's about, you know, being gay and growing up gay, but a lot of it's about it's being a gay man, but what I'm doing, especially like with teaching had really like gay is like not important. What I did want to mention about teaching though, it was, it was basically a don't ask, don't tell situation. So I wasn't openly gay with my students yet. I didn't deny it. And when they would ask me like, Oh, mister, do you have a wife? Do you have kids? And I was like, Oh, you know what? I don't discuss my private life with my students. And I go, well, why not? And I go, well, that's my policy. And they're like, Oh, okay. But you know, the thing is, only a gay teacher would say that. A straight teacher would not say that. They it. figured that out. I think a lot of them did. I never knew for sure, but it was it was literally a don't ask, don't tell situation. So you never had any gay students that came to you? Uh no. I mean, there were students that I know that were, were gay. And one time a gay straight alliance meeting was held in my classroom because it was during my conference period. And it was packed. There were like 40, 50 students. Oh. And so I recognized a lot of them, but I would never, I never did say like, oh, here's my gay story. I, I didn't do that because in public school, it's next to impossible to be openly gay. You, you would not have classroom management. And if you don't have classroom management, you can't teach no matter how good you are at teaching. If you don't have classroom management, so my approach, what do you mean by classroom management? Oh, I mean, to control, get students to behave, control, like control okay, right. follow the rules. Here's the rules. Here's the policies. Here's how you behave in class. Here's what you need to do. Here are your expectations. So 
people don't necessarily know that, but I mean, you a teacher has to have classroom management. If you don't have classroom management, you can't effectively teach. So I managed to have classroom management without bringing my personal life into it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I don't I honestly don't know how many students knew I was gay or did right. not know. I I honestly don't know. I imagine like a lot of them knew, but it was once again don't ask, don't tell. Mm-hmm. So it was not an issue. Do you believe in karma? Sometimes. Has the idea struck you that you tormented your teachers and that these kids have basically oh, ghetto school yes, tormented yes. you? Uh, you know, <laughs> the essay about the vocabulary words, I originally wrote it 20 years ago, and then I became the journalism teacher at my last high school. So I still had the same story, and then at the end, I said, you know, just like um, Ecclesiastes, there is there is nothing new under the sun. Right. And I opted not to have a vocabulary list in my classroom. But, you know, I have thought of that because, and see, that's another reason why I know, because I was the class clown. I knew what we did. I knew what I was doing. And I see that in others. And unlike most teachers, I would nurture the class clowns to become funnier. But yeah, I've thought about that, like karma. Yeah. I do bring that up in the one essay. Well, from reading your book, I liked Eduardo. Oh, yeah. Uh, How do we, let's see, what was the name of that essay? Oh, Getting the Balls to Become a Better Reader. Yeah, he was this class clown that was so obnoxious, and it was so hard to get him, but he loved to read out loud. He didn't, hardly ever did homework, and he was like this classic, like, edgy Latino student with this swagger, and he just had a way with other students. And, um, but I definitely, I had to put him in his place technically because he was so disruptive that I had to use comedy to win him over in a sense to get him to like be, you know, following the rules and that sort of thing. But yeah, that's a great essay. That's why well, reading the book, I didn't pick up that he liked that. Well, maybe a little bit I did toward the end there. But so give an example of what you did to this poor child. <laughs> <laughs> well, one time I was behind in my what I needed to have done. So I would start the class with a journal entry, five minutes, silent, sustained reading. They got to choose whatever novel they wanted to read. And then five minutes of a reading journal, um, writing their thoughts and feelings about what they just read. So he would just nonstop talking. I So I had my back to the students because I had to put a bunch a chart and a graph on the whiteboard. And I had to do that because I just got behind in my work and he would not stop talking. And this one particular day they were talking about blue balls and I wasn't even sure what that was. So once I finished that, I Googled it and I saw it's when your test, supposedly your testicles get so large from not jerking off that it becomes like a medical condition. But anyway, so he wouldn't, I go, I go, it's silent, sustained reading. I need you to do your reading. And then I had my back to them. He'd start talking. And they just kept talking about blue balls. So finally, I said to him, I go, you know what? I don't know why you keep talking about balls because it's not as if you have any. And then the the whole class goes, ooh. And then he kept- Mister. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He kept setting me up by saying like these basic things. And he'd say like, you know- um, well, you, you had to write about someone. It was a, um, an essay d- of description. So you had to write about someone who had an impact in your life. And so he goes, I'm going to write about my girlfriend, Eileen. And I go, you know, it's got to be nonfiction, not fiction. <laughs> and everyone's like, ooh. And then I looked at Eileen. And she's going, no, he's not my boyfriend. <laughs> so he just kept setting himself up. And he stumbled on this one word. It was about um, a Supreme Court justice who's retiring and they said that he was testy. And for some reason, he couldn't pronounce the word. And he kept going, test, 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 I go, testy. The word is testy. And we can all see why you might have difficulty with it, because testy sounds like testicle, which you don't have. <laughs> and so, like, everybody laughs. But, you know, he actually liked it because he's the type of student where, whether it's positive attention or negative attention, he wants attention. So I was just giving... Is that, was it Barnum that said that? What's that? Wasn't it Barnum 
P.T. Barnum that said something about that. It doesn't matter if it's bad or good as long as it's happy. Oh, I don't know. I'm not really sure, but that that very well could be. Yeah. I don't Trump, think I... Trump is on that same band. Oh, my way. God, yes. Yeah. He it doesn't is. matter if it's bad or good as long as yeah, I make a I'm few... in the middle of it. I make a few references to Trump, but it's usually about hair color and seasonal palette. <laughs> but yeah, so, um, yeah, and the funny thing with Eduardo is that, you know, he didn't turn in his homework one day, and then he left class. He just left class, walked out. Then he came back smelling like marijuana, and he goes, I, I wanted to turn in my homework. And I'm like, I don't accept homework. You turn in it on time or not at all. And he's, what, like 16 now? He was a junior, so he was 16. Okay. Yeah. And and then he dropped out of school. I'm like, oh, my God, there is a Buddha. So I didn't see him for the rest of the term. And then fa I fast forward like the next school year, and we're on a fire drill, so everyone's on the football field. And some of my former students, Eileen being one of them, and they said, oh, did you see Eddie? And I go, who's Eddie? I go, Eduardo. And I go, Eduardo, he's back in school? And they go, yeah, there he is over there in the bleachers where you're not supposed to be. And he's all dancing, but hey, hey. And so he was running for like homecoming king. And he was in the five member court of the boys. And I go, when they announced Eddie, they meant Eduardo? And they go, yeah. And so I was like, oh my God. So then he wins homecoming king. And so the rest, and he wasn't in my class anymore. <laughs> But whenever I would see him, I would come here, come here, I want to tell me something. I go, you should have been a prince, not the king. So I was saying that to him like, you know, three or four times during the school year. And then finally on April 1st, I ran into him and I go, come here, come here. You know what? I'm actually glad you got homecoming queen, a homecoming king. And he goes, he goes, oh, thanks, mister. I go, April fools. And ironically, that's the last time I ever saw him. But I hope he was quite hope a good flourishing and doing it. Who's to really say with that swagger? I just don't know. But yeah, he was a pretty unique student. I had a lot of students like him. So I would uh, incorporate humor and, you know, win the class over that way. You know, ironically, this is jumping ahead. I, I never had this as an essay in my book, but in order for me to retire, when I retired, everything has to be in sync, like Social Security, the teacher's retirement, the, the school, the teacher's union, everything has to be lined up. So I had to teach six weeks into the new school year. So I didn't tell my students that I was just temporary, that I was just going to, because I didn't want them to treat me like a substitute teacher, right? It's just a whole other story. So on the sixth week, it, it was my 65th birthday. So I did journal entries every day, like my entire career. So I said, you know, today is Mr. Milliken's 65th birthday. It's today's Mr. Milliken's birthday. He is now 65. Like many other 65 year olds, he will be retiring. And today is my last day. Write your thoughts and feelings about the last six weeks. And I was just thought, I, I thought maybe I'll get like a top 10. And I had like 170 journals. I got like a top 100. Wow. I was so shocked. Like well, what oh, did they say? They said stuff like, I always hated English class until I had you as a teacher. You know, I look forward to this class. You make everything so fun and entertaining, and you're such a great teacher. Uh, you take the time to explain the lesson to us, whether it's individually or as a group. And I'm just like, what are you talking about? Doesn't every teacher do that? So I went up to him and I go, why do you say that? I go, don't your other teachers do that? Oh, no, mister. So I had no idea how much they loved and respected me. And, what, and that's where you signed up for another 10 years of teaching, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, so it was a pretty, and I saved all the journals, but I didn't turn it into an essay because someone told me, like, you can't use another person's writing without giving them credit. So, and I thought it would kind of be like bragging too, but right. I mean, it just was really a great end point to my entire career because the students really appreciated me, like, way more than I actually knew because I'm such a pessimist. I always expect the worst, but I actually like got all this love and admiration and respect that I didn't really even know that the students were that way. So yeah, it was a really incredible final day. Mm -hmm. But So when you, you mentioned when we were chatting earlier that you moved a lot when you were younger. Well, we moved about every four or five years. 
So the most traumatic move was, I already mentioned, that was like the last month of third grade. That's what really changed my life and outlook and perspective. And that's when I actually decided to be funny as a survival mechanism. It's a defense mechanism. And, and did, you, well. did you also decide to stay in your apartment for almost half a century because oh. you moved so much? <laughs> <laughs> right. When my parents got divorced during my senior year in high school, for the next two years, my mom and I moved seven times. Like we moved into an apartment that our next door neighbor had a home. And so we moved into her home and unbeknownst to us, she wasn't paying the mortgage. So we got kicked out. So we moved into an apartment again and oh. then they changed the zoning of the apartment to be like the family section. So we didn't want that. So we moved again. And then my mom finally got remarried, and then I moved to finally be able to go to UCLA. So we actually moved like seven times. So I was just, I found moving very traumatic. So I moved into my apartment in fall 1976, and I've been there ever since. So now it's like 47 years. And it's rent control, huge three-bedroom. I pay one-third of what the new people move in pay. So it's like, why would I move? Right. So... Where is yeah. that? Is that in L.A. or Santa Sally? Monica? Oh, Santa Monica. Yeah, Santa Monica has really strict uh, rent control. They have actually what's called vacancy decontrol. So when someone moves out, instead of just raising it a certain percentage, they can raise it up to like market value. So yeah, like the new people that move in pay like twenty five hundred dollars more than I do. Wow, for the same unit. Well, I have a friend here that was on rent control in a New York City apartment in Upper West Side near Central Park, and he had three bedroom, like three thousand square foot for twelve hundred bucks. Oh wow, <laughs> mine is like thirteen hundred square feet, and it's a huge three bedroom. In fact, the hallway is so big that it's my laundry room with my washer dryer apartment style units. And yeah, I pay like thirteen hundred now. So yeah, it's yeah on his they raised he. he he knew he wanted to leave because he was coming to the West Coast, but he didn't tell him that. So he made a deal with him, got enough money, bought a new Mercedes. <laughs> and then he said they raised the rent. This was like 10 years ago. They raised it to $14,000 a month. Oh yeah. my God. From 1200 to 14000 Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I've lived in Southern California my whole life and I'm not well traveled. So I only know Southern California and- like my dad once said that the reason why we didn't go on summer vacations is because, because we live in Southern California. You don't need to go. You, you are on vacation. Because he's from upstate. He was from upstate New York. Where? Uh, a city called Newburgh, which I guess is close to West Point. I've been there. Oh. I've lived in Nyack and worked in Terrytown, which is Westchester County. But Newburgh is right above it. I had, mm. We had close friends from college. Yeah, I've never been to New York, so I don't really yeah. know. And I'm really bad with geography, so... I don't. I know he's from upstate New York, and that's about all I yeah. know. So, have you been single your whole life, or what? Pretty much, it's been like an on. Except this guy that I was dating regularly about ten years ago. I have sex at least twice a year, at whether least. you need it or not. Right. Whether I watch lots of porn though, so it's not as if I'm celibate. So, but there's just been there's one of my essays was about reaching a point in my life and reflecting. And one of the reasons why I've never been in a real, uh, like a long-term relationship is because of shame, internalized homophobia, fear of AIDS. But I was so ashamed of who I was that it would take somebody really great looking to elevate me above the shame. And of course that doesn't happen too often. And then another dynamic about my uh, sexuality of sense is that if you have unresolved conflicts with one of your parents, it doesn't matter if it's the mom or the dad, subconsciously you try to resolve that in a relationship. So my dad was very distant and aloof and sarcastic, and that's what I always found attractive in another guy. So obviously that's the wrong person, but that's who I'm attracted to. If someone's like really nice, I'm sort of like, yeah, not so much, not so interested. So that also factors in. But well, now, well, you know what? Fuck you, Steve. Do you want a date? <laughs> so we talk about 7, 730? <laughs> so I'm looking at the pictures in your book. Your father looked pretty hot, was he? Well, I think in terms of... I'm, I'm assuming hotness. that was your father. I mean, he looked, he looked 
pretty attractive to me. Right. Well, he was, but my mom was the one who was really strikingly beautiful because back in the 50s, people compared her to Grace Kelly. That's how pretty she was. I have a picture of her. It's not in the book, but it's when she was 18 and people are like, whoa. And people have even said like, oh, no wonder you're good looking that that's because I look just like my mom, like cheekbones, coloring, eyebrows. I was where that's dog. it. I was sitting here thinking you look like Grace Kelly. Well, my joke, my, <laughs> not so much. My joke used to be back when I was pursuing um, acting was like, if Grace Kelly and Rodney Dangerfield had Ooh. a kid, that would be me. Ooh, that's scary. I don't even, I don't want to. And I used to say, like, my my prop, my one of my problems with acting was I was a comic character actor trapped in a leading man's body. So I just wasn't like necessarily who I looked like. People are always saying, like, oh, you should be on a soap opera or, you know, this or that. I'm like, yeah, no, I'm plenty. I I wouldn't want to be on a soap opera. But yeah, no, my 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 parents were good looking. My brother was very good looking too. But is he still alive? Your brother? Yes, he's two years older. I remember, are, you, are you close or not? Yeah, actually, when we were younger, we didn't get along. But then once he got married, he transferred all of his anger and animosity towards his wife instead of me. So oh, we, cool. we've been like best friends ever <laughs> since. So we get along great now. Um, where, where does he live? He lives in Rancho Cucamonga, which is right next to Upland, where we went to high school. Pum- That's such a funny name for a town. I just don't. I know it used to be Alta Loma, and then they merged the city of Alta Loma with Cucamonga, and they decided to call it Rancho Cucamonga. That was a very bad decision. <laughs> yeah, Jack Benny used to, he's one of my role models. Jack Benny used to make a joke, like they used to say, like someone was from Cucamonga, like in such a crazy name that right. he would actually bring that up. Right. Huh. So where do you go from here? What's next? Well, right now I'm... Really, Besides dinner with your friend. Right now I'm really preoccupied with book promotion because it's such a steep learning curve that you've got to figure out how to navigate social media. And it's so difficult for my generation because we didn't grow up with computers. It's like learning a foreign language. So there's all this like reaching out and trying to get this and it's... it's it's uh, it's. I had no idea it was going to be like this. Once again, if I... Like, if I had any idea what teaching was going to be like, I don't think I would have done it. And, you know, writing the book, well, that seemingly was the hardest part. But now being an unknown author, making that transition to being known, it's like a huge obstacle to overcome. So I'm really focused on that. And I'm trying to, like, maybe find a, a booktuber or a bookstagrammer or a book talker and align myself. Because, I know the book is funny and really well written because I've been sharing my essays for 20 years. And I mean, I know they're funny, but if you, it's like, say you open up a restaurant in Los Angeles and you have like the best food ever and the greatest service. If no one knows about it, the restaurant's going to go out of business. So for me, it's like, what keeps me going is I know it's a funny book. I know it's, it's worth a lot of laughs. And then also it has that perspective of bridging the gay generation gap and I mean, we have a lot to learn from the younger generation as well, but they are basically clueless. Like they have no idea what it was like growing up gay. There were no gay role models. If if a gay person was in a movie, he was either the foppish clown who everybody ridiculed, or if he was a good person, he died at the end of the movie. Like that was the only representation. There were no gay role models. There was no internet. There was you couldn't talk about it. It was so forbidden, and you know that's like I fit right in because I was so in denial about not wanting to be gay. Right. So it was just such a, a a difficult process growing up gay. But you know, I think younger people they're going to learn a lot about themselves because you you learn from history, you learn from people in the media. I mean, you have role models and. So there's a there's a lot to learn, I think, from what it was like growing up gay in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Like, I didn't even know that Paul Lynn was gay. Like, a guy told me in 1975, he's like, uh, Paul Lynn, and this was in one of the essays in my book, um, and it wasn't my Rocky Horror Virginity show, it was the Brown Derby in Beverly Hills. And this guy told me, he was like hitting on me, he was like an actor, 
producer and I went to his apartment for him to help me out with my writing career. And um, he was telling me that Pauline was gay. And I was like, what? Because he had just done a sitcom where he played a dad. But that's how naive and ignorant I was. Like, I didn't even know that Paul Lynn was gay in 1975. Oh, he can't be gay because he's married and he has three kids. Yeah. And li right. like Liberace wasn't gay. He even won a lawsuit in the 50s with Confidential Magazine who accused him of being gay. And he fought them for defamation and he won. Because he wasn't gay? He said he wasn't? Right. Liberace said he wasn't <laughs> gay. He he filed he's a lawsuit. Just flamboyant. He's a flamboyant straight guy. Yeah. So that's that's how crazy it was back then, because even the most stereotypical gay guy like Liberace was denying it and won his lawsuit for defamation for calling him gay. It was suicide to be openly gay in the 50s, 60s, and 70s right. in terms of actors and everyone. Well, I've, I've had a lot of the actors and actually producers, directors on my podcast that are gay and they they tell that same story. Mm -hmm. And then people don't they they can't imagine that like what? Like because it's so different now. I mean, we still have a long ways to go. And that's another Oh no no no. No, didn't you get the memo? We're going back to the 50s. That's what some people want to do. Yeah. Same yeah, they want to name people. Yeah. Like even when they when they passed uh when they took out uh Roe versus Wade when they made abortion illegal uh, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas said, oh. you know what, we need to take another look at gay marriage and make that illegal again. So the enemy is from without. It should not be within. We need to be unified as a gay community because the enemy is from without. And we're stronger if we're unified, you know, younger generation and older generation. And there's so much to learn from each other. Like we can, we can still learn a lot from the younger generation. They can learn a lot from us and the struggles we went through. When I first started doing the podcast, I had, let's see who was here. I had a Airbnb guy. He was in his twenties. Oh, and then I had, um, my friend Edward, who I mentioned, he had the, the con or the uh, apartment on rent control in New York. He lived in New York for like 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. And so he has, and he went to studio 54. So he was here. And then my friend, Jerry, who was a Catholic priest for 30 years before he came out. Wow. So the four of us had dinner, and we were sitting out. It was, it was warm out. We were outside after dinner, and I I realized at that moment, and I'm probably going to do this some, at some point, I want to change my podcast or at least offer it on some of them where I would have like after dinner conversation because it was a fascinating conversation. The 20-something-year-old was like asking the other guys all these questions and because he, he didn't know any of it. And he was, they were telling him all this stuff. And it, right. it was a fascinating, I wish, I wish that I had a recording of that. It was just amazing. Yeah. I watch um, RuPaul's Drag Race. And one of the things I like so much about the show is when they're in the workroom and they're getting ready and they share their personal stories about, you know, being bullied and the trauma or being attacked. And it's so cathartic to share their stories of like, you know, violent encounters or just being attacked because you're gay. And it's just, it builds this community and it's, it's, it's just so emotionally impacting to share right. their stories. And we all need to do that more. Yeah. So we've reached the point in the podcast where I ask you, what have you learned in your life? Or do, what are some takeaways that you would share with my audience? I'm still learning this, but I would always tell this to my students is that we learn a lot more from our mistakes than what we do correctly. And I've learned a lot, but don't be afraid to make mistakes because you learn more from your mistakes. So we don't necessarily want to allow ourselves to do that because of the ego. But I used to tell my students, I go, you know, don't be afraid to make a mistake. Like, go ahead. You're going to learn from it. Don't try to do everything correctly. Don't try to be a perfectionist. Just discover life through your mistakes. And we're all bound to make mistakes and we keep making mistakes, but that's the biggest learning opportunities is from the mistakes that we make. So don't be afraid of them. Mm. I thought I made a mistake once, but I was mistaken. I didn't. Oh, <laughs> but, but I, I'm kidding. Yeah. That's a good no. one. Anyway, so we're going to put links in the podcast notes to your book so people can look it up. 
Great. And buy one. Yeah, I also have a website, uh, latebloomerbabyboomer.org, and I have some segments from essays, but I also have short three-minute comedy videos that are enactments of certain videos in a book. Right. So we'll, we'll put all, we'll put the, that link in as well. So, all right. Thank you for coming in. Hey, thanks for having me. It's, it's a fun one. And, uh, have a nice dinner with your friend and a safe trip back. Great. Thank you. Thanks again.